up, he'll struggle explaining some of the things. But I try to keep it simple. I hope that you will be able to understand the problem I'm trying to talk and the way that I'm trying to solve. Um, I just changed my title yesterday evening. Uh, after listening to John here, you know, he had a discussion about how to give. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, you know, drinking water or feed water to everyone. And uh, I just remember from my, my friend from Stanford who was saying that you know, everyone deserves a century of health. Uh, this may be becoming true, at least in the rich part of the world. Uh, but what about the rest? Can they also enjoy this benefit? So I will just start talking about this. <laughs> just feel that it is kind of echoing all the time. You know, is it possible that I put it a little bit further down? Yes. <coughs> okay. Yeah. I'll try with this one and see. Right? Maybe it's okay now. Yeah. Yeah. So the question that I'm interested in is about um, implants and how we can have smaller implants going all the way down to the cells and get this information from cells. So the, the idea is that when you have symptoms, uh, it's kind of things that, you know, it has brought us to a level that your organ is able to give some information to yourself. But before that, something is happening to the cells. The question is, can we get this information? How to get this information? Uh, without taking out something from inside. So normally if you have cancer, then you know they will take a tissue, put it in the microscope and see if there is a cancer. But can we have something inside, most likely for many years, that can give you information whether your heart is going to sort of stop, your baby can get a heart attack maybe in a couple of weeks, or you are in a stage that you are going to get cancer. But you are not cancer yet, so you really have the possibility to start breathing. So uh, just a small introduction about the university. I was listening to the, your vice chancellor yesterday. These numbers look like crazy for you guys. You, know, you have 800 colleges and 250,000 students. And we, have no, we don't have them, but that many numbers there. But we are, you know, big, the largest university, at least in Norway, which has only 5 million people. So these are the numbers for us. And I also work in the university hospital. So, it's, so that is actually 600 kilometers from Oslo is the capital. And this is a university hospital. And uh, it's also a big hospital. It's mostly small, about four other hospitals in Oslo region. But now considered as the largest hospital in the, north, uh, in the northern Europe. So it's the Nordic countries, for example. Um, I will not go through all the numbers here, just to give you an introduction. So I here in this hospital, I work in a research institute called Interaction Center. This is also very unique. So when they uh, designed this center in 1996, they wanted to put engineers like me working with physicians. So we are engineers and working physically co-located in research groups with physicians. And also we have operating theaters, so we have access to all operating theaters in our center. These are experimental for research. Of course we treat patients, so that's the real thing we do. Uh, so I, this is you know, myself with my colleague, he's a cardiac surgeon. Uh, he's in my group, and my my section is for biosensors and ICT. So I'm very green and also in the operating theater, um, but I don't work on patients. I mainly work on animals, so we can treat patients and animals in the same operating theater. Let me go very quickly through my research interests. So I'm interested in sensors, in body sensors and communications. I'm interested in how this information could be transmitted from inside to outside. 
And if you get this information, how can we do some kind of post process and understand certain things? And it potentially can be used for predicting certain events. And this potentially this can be used, for example, for you know uh, giving a precise diagnosis or treatment proposals, integrating with other type of information. I'm also interested in three different parts. That's for heart, brain, and the eye. And I will try to touch into those three parts in my talk and give you some examples of what we are doing. Uh, when it comes to the sensing and wireless communications, you have uh, different problems here exist. Because of the tissues and everything inside, so normally the radio frequency waves would be much uh, attenuated, so we need to find different solutions. Uh, we need to have also different types of data rates, depending on type of application we are considering. So it could be uh, less data rates, like smaller ones for cardiac patients. I will, I will also give you some examples for that, what that we are doing. I will also give you examples for wireless capsule media and the scope. Uh, so these are, this is the kind of the setting that I would like to sort of introduce my research. Uh, energy is a big problem. How to save energy? How to have these implants to last several years? For example, for pacemakers or leaders pacemakers, that's a new topic for us. We need to have devices implanted inside the heart working at least for 10 years on a single battery. So we're going to do sensing, uh, activation, like stimulation, and also transmitting data. How to do that is a challenge. And particularly in this talk, I'm not going to go through all these different techniques. I will touch upon only the, the backscatter technique a little bit, explaining the main idea and the results. Uh, I will not go into this uh, wireless power transfer today. Um, I will also talk a little bit about molecular communications. What is that? It's recently uh, introduced as a research topic uh, by my colleagues and myself probably around 10 years ago as growing in that field. So this is first example. It's about pacemakers. So you have a pacemaker which is like this here. So you have a can with leaves going inside the heart. And you have, this is the right side, it's called right ventricle, it's the right atrium. And you have another lead going to the left side. And the question here is that, why you need pacemakers? Anybody knows why you need pacemakers? <laughs> That's a good answer. It's basically your heart is going to stop. And you need to sort of inject the current so that you know you can you can get it start up and going. So pacemakers are basically to help to get the normal rhythm of the heart so that the heart can you know pump the blood. Uh, what people have been investigating is that there are a lot of lead related problems. So removing those leads have been quite interesting. So this can actually have the wireless interface today. But we are interested to remove all the leads so we can go from this a small capsule which already has a sensor, a battery, uh, a power injector, so it's a stimulator, but it does not have a transmitter. So it can sense, so we can put the device only in one part. So it can sense and it can, based on the sensor information, it's something called a, a waveform called QRS. I'm not going to go into all the details here. And based on that, if you miss that, then it will immediately inject the current. Problem actually is that that potentially will be useful only for 5 to 10 percent of the people who need it. What about the other ones who need something like this? Free channels, case, case, case So we need to find solutions so that they can have a capsule here in the atrium on the left side so that they, they are all three of them can communicate, exchange data, and make a decision. When to pace, and also in a synchronized way, among the capsules. 
So this is actually a real challenge. And there's no such solution available in the literature today. No product available. So we are interested in that. So in this talk, I will just consider only two parts. It's basically trying to study the, what we call it as the human body communication. It's a conductive communication without using radio frequency. So tapping into the conductive nature of the tissue and see whether we can transmit information through the tissues in an electrical signaling way without using RF. So I also have some results for RF, but I will just skip very fast. The last one is about using the self-cell communication, how we can use cell and piggyback data to the cell and transmit digital information to the cell. So I will skip this part, or maybe I'll just explain very briefly about so developing all these things, you need to have theoretical way of understanding how tissue work when it comes to RF, and developing that into some prototypes that we do, and testing it in phantoms. At the end, also, I can test it in, in animal. So I do that also in the hospital. Um, I will not go into explain all these parts here. The second part is maybe the most interesting part, it is when it comes to the energy point. Then it shows that when you put this small electrode-based antennas inside and using it to just to transmit electrical signal to the tissues, then we can have extremely efficient way of <coughs> transmitting information. And we can also have information transmission to the tissue not only in a distance, but in a very large scale also. So we can have high bandwidth data transmission. And I will show that information to you in the capsule work, where we can transmit, for example, video data up to 10 megabits per second. So this is the idea here is that, another one is that we want to eliminate the transceiver so that the capsule, the implant, do not have an active transmitter. The transmitter is going to sit outside or it just subcutaneously. So that part would be sort of signaling and reflection, based on the reflection, you will be able to transmit the data. So it's a zero power transmission solution. Does not, uh, um, does not consume any power for transmission. So the receiver is outside. So we call this as human body backscale communication. The second, the third one, or the second one, the most interesting one at least, from a theoretical point of view, to understand how the cell looks like. This is a cardiac cell. So we are we trying to understand the cell using my toolbox, this communication theory, signal processing and information theory and try to understand a cell like a communication system. So you have a transmitter inside, you have a small channel, you have a receiver. I will not go through all these parts, you know, in terms of the, the, the ion transfer and the ion pumps, the extracellular space and all these parts. I just explain you in a very simple way. And then when you connect these cells together, then you can you can imagine that there's going to be some kind of signaling going to one set to the next one. This is actually happening today to every one of us sitting here. The question now is, can we use different types of stimulation? So these are the different types of stimulation pulses. Can we use different types of stimulations so that I can, sometimes I can excite the cell, the other time I can just barely excite the cell, so it does not produce something called action potential. It's called as the membrane potential, which comes something like this. And then I would like to use this membrane potential to transmit information. So I would like to stimulate whenever I want to do pacing. So pacing means stimulation. And information transfer means membrane potential. So without interfering with the normal rhythm of the heart. Uh, I will go very quickly through this part. Um, I'm after to, I guess. Uh, so this is actually just to show how the heart looks like in a model. 
And this is actually is the way that you would like to understand when you apply different type of pulses and the energy expansion, uh, expenditure for the, the simulation or phase. Since uh, this is a theory computer model, uh, we would like to test it in practice. So what we did actually, we contact another group who could do this in vitro cell experiments for us. So they, the in vitro cell experiments basically done in this way. So you have this polymyocyte, a single cell. You put it on a dish. You connect it to uh, a, a small, two small electrodes. And then you can apply a current. And then, then you can measure the response. So you see the response here. Oh, it's done. And based on this, we have understood, for example, that what type of pulse shapes would be potentially useful when it comes to exciting a single cell so that it can phase. What type of pulse form would be useful when you can use it for communication? So just barely getting the memory to change the lapid movie. So this is for the communication part, um, how to transfer digital information to the cells. And these are, if you are a communication engineer, you will understand these are high diagrams. I will not go into all the details of that. But it's just to show you that it's possible, at least now, the first time that we have shown in the literature that you can really transmit a small amount of information between two cells or a bunch of cells. And this potentially will be opening up for a huge interest how to tap into different type of system that we have in our body. So what is the cardiovascular system? This is one of them. What about the nervous system? To the brain, for example. Can we send information to our nerves, directly to the brain, and signaling to the brain, or get information also from the brain? I have another example also for that. I will come back to you later on. So these are the ways. I'll just skip these parts very quickly. Some numbers, if you're interested in. You can see the performance when it comes to the power levels, um, path loss, all these things that normally communication engineers are interested in. Let me see whether I could work. Oh. Okay. So now I have shown you that uh, we can make tiny little small base made of capsules, devices that potentially can be put in very close to the cells. And from there, we would like to see whether how we can put them so that real patients can benefit from them. So engineers, you know, they think that, okay, we like to get rid of the wires. So, you know, wireless communication is interesting, but does it benefit the patients? So that's the key question that we would like to answer. So here, for example, we are interested in that 30% of the, the patients who see pacemakers today, they don't respond to that. They don't respond to that. Data. So the question is why? Does it mean that we need to implant those pacemaker electrodes or capsules in the optimal size? If you have multiple of them, can we find a digital way of doing it so that we take into the electrical and the mechanical um, models of the heart, integrate that, and make an optimize it? based on the patient's specific data. So we can get MRI data of the heart, that particular patient. Then we can really optimize the placement side. And in this way, we can treat those patients so that they will be able to respond to the treatment. So this is an ongoing work at the hospital. So the model is there. The capsules are there. So we're interested to understand whether there are those 30 person patients who don't respond to their treatment today, whether they can they, they can get some help from this technique. 
the other problem that I would like to discuss is um, the colon cancer. So this is actually a, a cancer that people get, both for men and women. The second deadliest cancer in the world, at least in the Western world. Uh, the first, at least for women, is breast cancer. For men, is prostate. So here, for example, something called polyp. This is a big bowel. This is a polyp. A polyp is a small tissue growth inside the bowel and potentially can become cancer. So the, the whole idea is that whether we can get rid of this as soon as it's there. And what are the ways of doing it so that maybe we can address those 15 person potentially will be in a very dangerous situation. So countries like Norway, we have a population-based screening program when we are around 55. So every, every 50 years, when after 55, you will be offered a way of doing screening. And this is basically to identify whether you have polyp and then you would like to remove it. The current methods, there are three different methods of doing that. One is called as traditional way, colonoscopy, so that you know you insert a fiber optic cable with the camera inside, and then you can visualize the, the colon and see whether you see polyps. The second one is a small pill. It's a digital pill, which having two cameras on both sides, and it has a micro um, microcontroller, battery, uh, LED lights, and also a transmitter, a wireless transmitter inside, the battery. So what happens is that you get this pill, uh, you get a liquid so that you can clean the bowel, and then you take the pill, and the pill travels using the peristatal movement uh, in the bowel. So by itself, there is no active movement. And then you have a belt with a recorder recording this information or the digital video that is coming from the area. Unfortunately, the image quality is not very good because the image resolution is around 256 by 256 pixels, around 1 to 3 frames per second. So sometimes this pill can miss polys just because it moves it by itself. It tumbles, it rotates, everything when it comes to different um, pockets in the, in the column, and this is a problem. So we are in a project with, this is a part of an European project, that we are working with a company who is interested in having an active way of steering this capsule so that you can investigate the column within 10 minutes. Here you will have to have the pill at least going for 8 to 10 hours. But here you can do this in 10 minutes, but having a, a way of steering it. It becomes like a small robot, not exactly the way that the robot we have heard today, but this is a tiny little capsule with a magnet, so that it's a magnet control part. I think I have a, let me just skip this part. So this is actually a small magnet that you can control it outside with small joystick. And they have developed a small robot to sort of control this device outside. But it has a film inside. The main problem for them is that they need to use a video, real-time video streams coming from inside to navigate this film in, inside the column so that you can investigate where if you find any polyp or not. So this is a very interesting project that we are working with them, trying to provide a backscatter method. So I mentioned that backscatter method is also used for pacemakers. But now the same idea, the same method that we are providing for this company so that they would like to implement and test it whether this is going to work in clinic. Now there is another problem is maybe coming. Okay. So 
I think um, Thanks there. Yeah. So yeah, I, I was explaining to you about this uh, backscatter technique that we are using. Um, it's a just a switch, so you have a camera information coming down into the bits, and it goes to the switch, and you have an antenna basically modulating the, the digital information coming. So it's basically a reflection and the modulation transmitting the information back to the receiver. So this, I will not go in and explain all these parts to you. So I think you understand the concept of how it works. Um, this is the way that we have implemented this method. And as you see, you know that the capsule looks like this. And uh, tested in different ways. This is a phantom test that we have done. And uh, here we have the implementation is, uh, in, a, in a capsule. You, know, you see the antenna, so it looks like. And this is a shelf, and it has camera on both sides. Um, so, so, what we have done basically is that you know, we develop a new theory, and also do computer simulation to make sure that it potentially can work at least in the computer. And then we develop prototypes. So we go all the way to test it in the phantom. The so phantom is basically like mimicking how the human tissue is. Um, you know, electrical pumps in the human tissue so that we can get this information that it's going to work before we do the animal test. Of course, we, the next step is to get some kind of FTF rule so that we can bring this device and test it on humans, so potentially in collaboration with companies. So the, the other problem, I think some of you would be quite interested, is that uh, so if you have these type of images, today a physician has to sit and browse all this video data. And if you have 8 to 10 hours of video, it, it will take maybe a couple of hours going through the data. Can we automate this process using you know, advanced video processing techniques like machine learning or deep learning type of methods. And that is also quite interesting for us. Uh, issue is that currently a physician is missing 25% of the part. Using the traditional method that I was explaining to you, the colonoscopy, so you put a cable uh, and, and do the investigation. Some polyps are extremely difficult to see, but he is missing, even he is highly trained. So the question now is, can we uh, engineers come up with a solution so that we can improve or give a tool so that, okay, the machine is able to detect polyps, and then he can check whether this is a polyp or not. So this is actually having a different problem. This is about classification, uh, localization, and also detection. So I will very quickly go through these problems. Uh, so we have a very different uh, shapes of polyps. So here you see the polyps, you know, looks like this. Some of them are very small. Uh, some of them you may not be able to see it. The other one is that these are not polyps. They, are, they look like polyps, but they are not polyps. Um, so how to detect those type of uh, polyps uh, or looks like polyps, but they are not polyps. Uh, we don't want to have them in our detection. The other one is that, yeah, this is also very difficult to see. Um, this is actually the annotated ground truth, and the polyp is somewhere here. Normally, it's not easy to see, at least for me as an engineer. Um, yeah, the other one is about uh, we don't have enough data sets. And also, we need to have a physician to sit and go through all the videos and do the annotations. So, can we use maybe a deep learning method to a semi-automatic way of annotating the data? Is it possible? So, we have done different things, and of course, this is something you guys know from the image and competition, how it is being working, you know, when it comes to cats and dogs or even human faces. Uh, we have done more or less the same, uh, extended this work 
here saying positive RCM. And, and our results show, I didn't want to go through all the uh, you know, deep learning uh, parts uh, with uh, generating you know, synthetic polyps using GAN and also using CNN for annotation. Uh, but I just show you the results. So, so when you come up with these type of results, it's very difficult to compare your work with some other people's work. Uh, luckily, there is a competition for this. It's part of this conference called MITI. Anybody knows MITI conference here? They said medical imaging is one of the top conferences in medical imaging. And they organized this competition. Um, I, I, they have been doing that for the last three, four years. In 2018, we participated, we also participated in 2015. And these are the results. And as you see, based on the results, that the computer is able to detect polyps around 80%. It's much higher than a, a physician who was able to detect polyps 75%. So, of course, this is not good. but Potentially, there's a lot of improvement that we have seen during the last years. And it looks like we will come very close to 95% maybe in a couple of years from now. Having enough data set, a good way of doing training, so that we just give the, uh, our method to the uh, organizers who do the inference by themselves. So it's a transparent way of comparing different people's work. So all these are different groups for participating in the company. The other one that I would like to uh, ask is now that we can detect polyps, uh, can we say this is cancer or not a cancer? So that is the second part of the problem that I would like to also answer, is that going from here, you see something else, and of course to do this, we use something called narrowband imaging. It's a slightly different type of imaging than using visible light. It's around 400 nanometers, like a green light. And using the green light, we will be able to visualize micro vessels, structures, pretty much very coming closer to understanding this is a cancer. There are three different classes of cancer. When we talk about hyperplastic, it's a normal tissue, it's not cancer, so that is good. The second one is the stage is going to become a cancer. But it is not a cancer yet. Malignant means that it's a cancer. So our interest is that if we can find this, then the physician will make a decision whether the, the, he needs to remove the polyp or he will ask the patient to come back maybe in three months or six months to see whether this has grown into this stage. In this stage, then he will immediately remove the polyp. If you remove it here, then you are safe. But if you are here, you will have maybe another six to eight months to live. So that's basically the, the work when it comes to um, GI. This is another work that uh, we are doing when it comes to brain cancer. This is a very aggressive form of brain cancer. It's called glioblastoma. Uh, there is unfortunately no cure for this. Also, it's extremely difficult to detect. So we got a very nice project funded by the EU. Uh, it's a very prestigious brand. It's uh, like um, getting uh, acceptance rates around two to three percent. So you have to try several times to get this grant. So our approach is to use this molecular communication framework that we can target this cancer cells in the brain. The main problem today when it comes to this type of cancer is that we are unable to penetrate something called blood-brain barrier. So the vessels that we have inside the brain actually has something to do with there is a barrier there so that only the oxygen proteins are able to penetrate. So of course that is needed for the cells inside the neurons, the cells. <coughs> drugs normally have much larger size, and they are not able to penetrate. So here we are trying to use something called artificial cells 
is called as a neuroprogenitor cell. So it takes from the same human and re-engineering the cell into neural stem cells and using the neural stem cell to release something called vesicles. And these vesicles will target these cancer cells and reprogram them to kill them. And this will be reported with the diagnostic information that we can get it from the outside. And then we have a closed form of you know, getting this information and radiating, for example, RF signals so that we can activate more release. So in this way, we can control the release, make sure that the, the vesicles come here, and there is a reporter that we can receive on the outside. I think I will not go too much into that. Uh, this work mainly was done by a good collaborator coming from Stanford. He was a postdoc in Stanford at the time. Now he's a professor at Michigan State. Um, discovered that this extracellular vesicle potentially can be useful. And this is actually the first work in this field. And, uh, and this is actually the foundation for this project also. So using the exosomes, they are the size of 3,250 na nanometers. So extremely small uh, uh, you know, vesicles. And these vesicles can contain microRNA, and microRNA could be used to download that to the cell, the cancer cell, and reprogram. So in this way, we can kill the cancer cell. Um, I will not go into all the details. Maybe I'm... How am I doing? Is it... Sorry? Okay, I'm beyond the time schedule. Okay. I thought I started at 1 o'clock, it's uh, not even 1.45. So at least I have five more minutes to go, at least according to my clock. Yeah, but I, I will try to wrap it up very soon. You know, I, I, I don't want to go into all the technical details about this work. Um, again, this is like the electrical engineering work of approaching like you have a transmitter, you have a channel, you have a receiver. How to optimize it in a way that you have a more um, precise way of transmitting data from one place to another place. But data in a sense is not voice, it's not sensor data. It's like small vesicles and how to transmit them from one place to another place. Uh, this is again not radio transmission. It's uh, transmission in, in tissues in the extracellular space. So we are talking about uh, Brownian motions. So we go back into physics and understanding how the motions are going to be and, and model this in a way to understand. Uh, you know, we talk about neurons, we talk about astrocytes. If you are not understanding all these things, don't, think, well, don't worry about that. You know, it's a very complex problem that we have in the brain. Um, okay. I think I will also not go into all the, the math behind here. Yeah. You know, um, you may not be able to grasp all these things. It's quite late also in the year. Um, so I just want to wrap up just to show you the my lab, what we are doing, and this is actually the, the core idea of my research, is to see whether we can target cells, and how to target them, and why it is quite interesting. And to do this work, of course, we are also came up with uh, other groups. So we have a good collaboration with groups coming from the United States, from Stanford, Georgia Tech, and Michigan State and also with the university at NTNU and also Austin University Hospital. So the whole research is focused in these five topics. One is designing biological circuits and system. So this is like a small chip, but it's a biological chip. So designing them, engineering them, 
to have functions like sensing. They also have computing functions. And also they can also transmit information. And then we would like to understand how this information could be transmitted from an engineer itself to a receiver. And this receiver potentially will be another cell, but integrated with electronics. That would be able to transmit the, the physical world from the biological world to the physical world. There are different ways of also doing the testing or the simulations. So you have computer simulations. This is called organ on chip. Organ, miniaturized organ on a chip. And then animal models before we can get into humans. Just want to thank the group. You know, all this work was not done by myself. I have three colleagues uh, who have just from decision in my group coming from USA, from Georgia Tech, Ian Activities from he was from Stanford, now he is at Michigan State. And Chris and Masamitsu, all these people are also part of my team. And the rest of them are my teaching students and postdocs. The funding is given by different projects, mainly coming from the research council from Norway and also from the new from Horizon. Thank you so much. Thank you for the talk about life and showing light on topic cancer and different techniques to detect it. Now I would welcome. I think I will uh, use mine. So the the other problem I think some of you would be quite interested is that uh, so if you have these type of images today, a physician has to sit and browse all this video data. And if you have eight to ten hours of video, it, it will take maybe a couple of hours going through the data. Can we automate this process using, you know, advanced video processing techniques like machine learning or deep learning type of methods? And that is also quite interesting for us. Uh, issue is that currently a physician is missing 25 percent of the part using the traditional method that I was explaining to you, the colonoscopy, so you put a cable uh, and, and do the investigation. Some polyps are extremely difficult to see, but he is missing, even he is highly trained. So the question now is, can we uh, engineers come up with a solution so that we can improve or give a tool so that, okay, the machine is able to detect polyps, and then he can check whether this is a polyp or not. So this is actually having a different problem. This is about classification, uh, localization, and also detection. So I will very quickly go through these problems. Uh, so we have a very different uh, shapes of polyps. So here you see the polyps, you know, looks like this. Some of them are very small. Uh, some of them you may not be able to see it. The other one is that these are not polyps. They, are, they look like polyps, but they are not polyps. Um, so how to detect those type of uh, polyps, uh, or looks like polyps, but they are not polyps. But we don't want to have them in our detection. The other one is that, yeah, this is also very difficult to see. Um, this is actually the annotated ground truth. And the polyp is somewhere here. Normally, it's not easy to see, at least for me as an engineer. Um, yeah, the other one is about uh, we don't have enough data set. And also, we need to have a physician to sit and go through all the videos and do the annotation. So, can we use maybe a deep learning method to a semi automatic way of annotating the data? Is it possible? So we have done different things, and of course, this is something you guys know from the image and competition, how it is being working you know, when it comes to cats and dogs, or even human faces. Uh, we have done more or less the same, uh, extended this work using Foster OCM. And, and our results show, I didn't want to go through all the uh, you know, deep learning uh, parts uh, with uh, generating, you know, synthetic polyps 
using GAN and also using CNN for annotation. Uh, but I just show you the results. So, so when you come up with these type of results, it's very difficult to compare your work with some other people's work. Uh, luckily, there is a competition for this. It's part of this conference called MITAI. Anybody knows MITAI conference here? They said medical imaging is one of the top conferences in medical imaging. And they organized this competition. Um, I, I, they have been doing that for the last three, four years. In 2018, we participated, we also participated in 2015. And these are the results. And as you see, based on the results, that the computer is able to detect polyps around 80%. It's much higher than a, a physician who was able to detect polyps 75%. So, of course, this is not good. but Potentially, there's a lot of improvement that we have seen during the last years. And it looks like we will come very close to 95% maybe in a couple of years from now. Having enough data set, a good way of doing training so that we just give the, uh, our method to the uh, organizers who do the inference by themselves. So it's a transparent way of comparing different people's works. So all these are different groups for participating in the competition. The other one that I would like to uh, ask is now that we can detect polyps, uh, can we say this is cancer or not a cancer? So that is the second part of the problem that I would like to also answer, is that going from here, you see something else. And of course, to do this, we use something called narrowband imaging. It's a slightly different type of imaging than using visible light. It's around 400 nanometers, like green light. And using the green light, we will be able to visualize micro vessels, structures, pretty much very coming closer to understanding this is a cancer. There are three different classes of cancer. When we talk about plastic, it's a normal tissue, it's not cancer, so that is good. The second one is the stage is going to become cancer. But it is not a cancer yet. Malignant means that it's a cancer. So our interest is that if we can find this, then the physician will make a decision whether that, that he needs to remove the polyp or he will ask the patient to come back maybe in three months or six months to see whether this has grown into this stage. In this stage, then he will immediately remove the polyp. If you remove it here, then you are safe. But if you are here, you will have maybe another six to eight months to live. So that's basically the, the work when it comes to um, GI. This is another work that uh, we are doing when it comes to brain cancer. This is a very aggressive form of brain cancer. It's called glioblastoma. Uh, there is unfortunately no cure for this. Also, it's extremely difficult to detect. So we got a very nice project funded by the EU. Uh, it's a very prestigious grant. It's uh, like um, getting uh, acceptance rates around two to three percent. So you have to try several times to get this grant. So our approach is to use this molecular communication framework that we can target this cancer cells in the brain. The main problem today when it comes to this type of cancer is that we are unable to penetrate something called blood-brain barrier. So the vessels that we have inside the brain actually has something to do with there is a barrier there so that only the oxygen proteins are able to penetrate. So of course that is needed for the cells inside the neurons, the cells. <coughs> drugs normally have much larger size, and they are not able to penetrate. So here we are trying to use something called artificial cells. It's called as a neuroprogenitor cell. So take from the same human and re-engineer the cell into neural stem cells. And using the neural stem cells to release something called vesicles. 
And these vesicles will target these cancer cells and reprogram them to kill them. And this will be reported with the diagnostic information that we can get it from the outside. And then we have a close form of you know, getting this information and radiating, for example, RF signals so that we can activate more release. So in this way, we can control the release, make sure that the, the vesicles come here, and there is a reporter that we can receive on the outside. I think I will not go too much into that. Uh, this work mainly was done by a good collaborator coming from Stanford. He was a postdoc in Stanford at the time. Now he's assistant professor at Michigan State. Um, Dr. Mixer discovered that this extracellular vesicle potentially can be useful. And this is actually the first work in this field. And, uh, and this is actually the foundation for this project also. So using the exosomes, they are the size of 3,250 na nanometers. So extremely small uh, uh, you know, vesicles. And these vesicles can contain microRNA. And microRNA could be used to download that to the cell, the cancer cell, and reprogram it. So in this way, we can kill the cancer cell. Um, I will not go into all the details. Maybe I'm... How am I doing? Is it... Sorry? Okay, I'm beyond the time schedule. Okay. I thought I started at 1 o'clock. It's uh, not even 1.45. So at least I have five more minutes to go. I think according to my clock. Yeah, but I, I will try to wrap it up very soon. You know, I, I, I don't want to go into all the technical details about this work. Um, again, this is like the electrical engineering work of approaching like you have a transmitter, you have a channel, you have a receiver, how to optimize it in a way that you have a more um, precise way of transmitting data from one place to another place. But data in the sense is not voice, it's not sensor data, it's like small vesicles and how to transmit them from one place to another place. Uh, this is again not radio transmission, it's uh, transmission in, in tissues in the extracellular space. So we are talking about uh, Brownian motion. So we go back into physics and understanding how the motions are going to be and model this in a way to understand it. Uh, you know, we talk about neurons, we talk about astrocytes. If you are not understanding all these things, don't, think, well, don't worry about that. You know, it's a very complex problem that we have in the brain. Um, okay. I think I will also not go into all the the math behind here, yeah. you know, um, you may not be able to grasp all these things. It's quite late also in the year. Um, so I just want to wrap up just to show you the my lab, what we are doing. And this is actually the, the core idea of my research, is to see whether we can target cells and how to target them, and why this is quite interesting. And to do this work, of course, we are also came up with uh, other groups. So we have a good collaboration with groups coming from the United States, from Stanford, Georgia Tech, and Michigan State, and also with the University of NTNU and also Austin University Hospital. So the whole research is focused in these five topics. One is designing biological circuits and system. So this is like a small chip, but it's a biological chip. So designing them, engineering them to have functions like sensing. They also have computing functions. And also they can also transmit information. 
and then we would like to understand how this information could be transmitted from an engineer itself to a receiver. And this receiver could potentially will be another cell, but integrated with electronics. That would be able to transmit the, the physical world, from the biological world to the physical world. There are different ways of also doing the testing or the simulations. So you have computer simulations. This is called organ on chip. Organ, linear charge organ on a chip. And then animal models before we can get into humans. Just want to thank the group. You know, all this work was not done by myself. I have three colleagues uh, who have just a decision in my group coming from the USA. From Georgia Tech, Ian Activist from, he was from Stanford, now he is at the State. And Chris and Masamitsu, all these people are also part of my team. And the rest of them are my teachers students and postdocs. The funding is given by different projects, mainly coming from the research council from Norway and also from the from Horizon. Thank you so much. Thank you.